years ago, I was a kid in this church, and uh, years ago, churches uh, felt like they had to choose. Are we going to proclaim Jesus, or are we going to demonstrate Jesus? And there's, we've got a slide on this. Uh, on the one side, there were churches that were focused on social justice, and we're going to feed the poor and visit the prisoner. And then on the other side were the churches that declared Jesus and won people's souls. And there was a gap between those churches, and whole denominations went one way or the other. And entire churches went one way or the other. And then a couple decades ago, as I was traveling and meeting with prevailing churches and asking them, where is the Spirit of God at work in your church? We got another slide. This is where it was. The Spirit of God was at work in these churches where biblical justice, visiting the prisoner, you know, walking with the poor, um, caring for the homeless, uh, and Jesus proclaimed where that came together. And so that's who we've wanted to be as a church. And uh, this morning we have uh, almost a father of that movement. Uh, maybe a grandfather of that movement. Uh, and uh, we wanted to get him here because uh, uh, he, his life, his experiences, his uh, organization, his theology are right in this circle of biblical justice and Jesus. So, John, you want to say good morning to our folks here? Yes, and... yes. Sure. You, don't, you don't know this. <laughs> it, it's, um, you, you can feel and know, couldn't expect you to, the sense of joy, fulfillment, to be here, invited by you, welcomed by you to see and to feel this kind of response to this issue of preaching a gospel that is, that is whole, uh, a whole gospel on a whole mission to the whole world. Faith and works and tied together. That is the gospel. And that y'all invited me to be a part of it. So thank you so very much for doing this. I want to spend the remaining of my life really encouraging that kind of leadership, especially with this new emerging generation. So thank y'all for inviting me. All right. Now, John and I, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask him questions. He's going to answer these questions, and he's a preacher. So if he starts preaching, I may come up and ask him another question. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's yeah. okay. He'll get his preaching in. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. John, I want you to tell the story of you coming to Jesus, yeah. how God used your son to help you come to Jesus. Yeah. You know, I, I grew up without an intact family. My mother died when I was seven months old. My father uh, couldn't read or write. He dumped this five of us off at his grandmother's house and my grandmother his mother my grandmother she gave three of the children away she kept me because I was sick after my mother died and, and kept my oldest brother because he was old enough to plow on the plantation that we lived on uh, he went into the service and spent his time over there fighting Hitler trying to rid the world of racism and bigotry came back home in about six months he was killed in a racial incident in my own hometown. With that, I, of course, I, just like so many others, I left Mississippi and went to California, never intended to come back. A lot of good things happened to me. I met Vera May, I got a wife, got her 64 years ago and still got her. She gave me eight children, I, I got them, <laughs> seven of them. And, and when he was just a little boy, there was a group we had bought us a nice house in California. It was sort of integration period. And, uh, and before the whites left, they was trying to win the people in that community, which was commendable. I would uh, do that. And they had this child evangelism where they would invite these children after school to come into the house and where they would tell them stories. And they had the church. The church was just a few blocks down from where I live. And they invited my son, Spencer. He was about three and a half years old. And then uh, he went to it. And uh, he'd come home. He was telling these, singing these little songs. 
I had never heard before, and I'm not a religious, I wasn't a religious person. We were bootleggers and gamblers, you know, we didn't go to religious <laughs> church. So I'm not, I'm not the typical black Pentecostal, God type person. That, that ain't my, that wasn't my upbringing. I like it, I like it, but I didn't have any experience with it. And, and so they invited, he invited me to go with him to Sunday school. They got him in a Sunday school. And I went because he invited me. I loved him so much, you know. And I went there because I grew up without that love. And I, and I went there, and I, they was, as I said, they was preaching the gospel. They were singing these songs that I had never heard before. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, brown and yellow, black and white, they all are prayed. They didn't do that in Mississippi. The governor was standing in the door keeping those little children from coming in. And Deacon was there standing at the door keeping those little children from coming in. Well, you know, I, so, but I heard that. I thought this was something significant. And so I went back. And I went back. They got me into the, the a Bible study there. And one morning, they was sharing the gospel. And uh, this is when God, the Holy Spirit, took the word of God and spoke to me. Paul was explaining uh, a bigotry. He was explaining that that didn't match the gospel. To be a racist didn't match the gospel. Peter, you know, was when the Gentiles came up, he, 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 he ate with them. When the Jews came there, he wouldn't eat with them. And Paul said, uh, you're not walking according to the gospel. You know, and uh, and then Paul tells his own story, what how he was walking. He said, "I'm walking this way because I have been crucified with Christ. Amen. Nevertheless, I live; yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh," he said, "I live by the faith of the son, faith and the grace of the Son of God, who loved me and gave Himself for me." That's for the first time I said, Lord, if there is a God in heaven that loved me enough to send his only begotten son into the world to die for me, I want to know that God. I came to know that God. I gave my life to him, and I've been trying to follow him ever since. But I, but I, but I still need him as my leader. I, I, I can't quite trust myself enough. I'm prone to wonder. I'm prone to lead this God I love. So I have to stay in touch with him. I have to confess my sin to him. And I feel sinful when I sin. He reminded me of that. But he said, if I, he loves me. If I confess my sin, he's faithful in chess to forgive my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Yeah, so this has been my purity here. It's so good. Now, you left Mississippi, you went to California, lived in a nice house, and then God touched your heart and called you back to Mississippi, where you and your wife, Vera Mae, uh, where you didn't plan to go back to Mississippi. No. So no. you got your wife and your six kids at that point, and you went back. So how did God call you? How did he touch your heart there? Well, I tell you, I was, uh, God did bless me. When I was converted, I was disciple. I got in, and I was uh, wanting to be a businessman. I was sort of a businessman, a little bit successful, and uh, and so I joined this group of Christian businessmen. They call them CBMCs, and uh, I'm, in fact, I was the first black for a long time that was a part of it. But they had a ministry up in the San Dimas Mountain in California, right there in Southern California. And they, they went up there in the morning to, to, to have worship service with the prisoners. And they asked me to go. You know, I had shared my testimony with them. And, uh, and so they want me to go. I found out later why they wanted me to go. Because the prison way back then was predominantly black. Two minutes. So I went there and I shared my testimony. I shared what God had done for me, how I grew up in poverty in Mississippi, how I come to know Jesus Christ, and now I've got a good job and that kind of thing. And as I was sharing the love of Christ, uh, I looked in the back, I was almost finished, and I looked in the back, and there were some boys, two black boys there. It was predominantly black. 
and, uh, and they were just crying and shaking. In fact, as I'm finishing, and it sort of aggravated me a little bit. And so when I got through, I went back there to sit with them to find out what was happening. And they were just crying, almost like hugging me. They said, our life is just like your life. I don't know what happened to the little boy, but that was God's call on my life. Because they were speaking Ebonic, broken English like me. Their parents had brought them out there, and they're in jail. And here I am, a son of a successful guy. Boy, that was my call. I was called, and my job been fulfilling, and I loved it so much, wasn't fulfilled anymore. Because I felt that God had called me to get my life completed to him, not only in uh, knowing him, but also to make him known. Because that is really the purpose of God yeah. coming into our lives. Yes. That fact, that's why we was born to know God and to make him known and to know that he has a purpose for our life. And that his purpose is for good and not for evil, to give us a hope and a future. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so you left California and you went back to Mississippi. God had called you there. And Vera May finally said, it's okay, we can go. Yeah. I'll say yes to God. And then... Yeah, uh, she, she'd been from a better family. We were bootleggers and gamblers. She went to, from a better family. They, she went to school. She went to college. She's sort of an English fanatic, and I'm an Ebonic speaker and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and to go back to Mississippi, to go back to Mississippi after we got our big house, man, and, and I wanted to go so bad, I, you know, I got sick. And one morning she came knelt down by the bed and said, oh, God, I don't want to go. Lord, would you make me have the will to go? And then she, after three years, you know, after some time, we went back to Mississippi. The unique thing, though, and I say this to everybody, to, uh, we are making people's Christians without discipling them. Being a Christian is a behavior. It, it's not just something, I'm a Christian. Jesus says, go into all the world and disciple them. Disciple the nation. Teach them to observe me. And so a Christian is somebody who's trying to behave like Christ. And what I was saying this morning, it is Christ in us, the hope of glory. He's our shepherd. With the Father, him, I know I need a shepherd. I'm prone to wonder. I'm prone to leave this God I love. So I need a shepherd to lead me. And, and you need a shepherd. He's a good shepherd. He laid down his life uh, for the sheep. And so I, I went back there and I've been stumbling and falling. But boy, to look back now and to be in a place and longing for blacks and whites and Jews and Gentiles to cut out this bigotry and obey what the Bible says. In Christ there is neither Jew nor Gentile, born nor free, but we are one in Jesus Christ. We come on reading that and still be bigots. And think people are supposed to believe that yeah. in our life. Oh, I'm so glad that we are moving past that. Yeah. I'm so glad for this generation. I don't think we can stop it. I don't think we stop it. I think God is doing this. The, the government have tried it and failed. I think we got a shot at it. I think that, and I'm seeing it. That's what this week has been like. That's what this week has been like. It's been like us coming together and talking about that and enjoying the joy of it. And, and then I, I like this music. Oh, Lord. Okay, I got another question for you. Yeah, yeah we like the music, too. Yeah, we like the music, too. Okay. Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground, all other ground is sinking sand. Okay, so you're back in Mississippi. Back to, preaching. Back, back to Mississippi. Yeah. I told you, he's going to be preaching. Don't worry about this. Uh, we're back in Mississippi. 
and uh, uh, you get in civil rights in the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, they're kind of coming after you and your home yeah. and your family yeah. and some friends stepped up because you say this is not about programs This is about people. This is about friends. Yeah. Can you tell that story of your friends? Yeah, I'm gonna tell that story. Okay, because people ask me now They ask me now Well, it hurts me. Yeah They ask me now When did you almost why did you? When did you join the civil rights movement? I was just like you. I was born to be free. And to ask me, some people coming along there, going to make me, being joined in the civil rights movement made me a human being in America. And so I joined it in. When the voting time comes, there ain't no way. Because one vote, one human in America. That's what the Ferguson case was all about. The, the, white, the black man had no rights that the white man had to respect. It made me a human in asking me that question. And so we decided we wanted to be free. And we started arresting people to vote. The Ku Klux Klan got on us. They began to, you know, they killed two whites and a black, put them in a dam. A preacher led it. A Baptist preacher was leading it. And so, yeah, what was the church in all of this? And so they, these men, they said, we don't, for the first time when we was in this town, I was doing work in this town, they said, we want to select our own leader. And I, they selected me to be the leader. And when the Klux Klan started riding, they got their guns, and they came. And every night, they would protect our house and protect my children. And like, it spoiled me. I, they saved our life because for the first time, I was living among people who was obeying Jesus. Greater love than no one in this. Then they would lay down their lives for the friends. They didn't want to kill nobody. But they got the Ku Klux Klan away in our, in, in, in our life. And I'm, so it has made it tough for me today. It's tough to be a leader in a way, but it's tough to be with people who are so shattered. Yes. Say one thing and mean nothing. Not only do we don't care for each other, we sneak on each other, we kill each other. We are killing more people in the ghetto than any white policeman and everybody put together for everyone. That policeman shouldn't be killing nobody. That's horrible. They're here to protect us. Ain't no excuse for that. But we kill 200 of ourselves for every 100, for every two or three that somebody else killed. Yes, black lives matter. All lives matter. That ain't no good question. Life, that question should never be asked because that's what the creation was about, life. It was about life. And life, it matters. It matters. But all lives matter. And Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. All of us. What option do we have of being pro-life? Are we pro-death? Okay. Yeah. I'm with you. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. I want you to tell one more story. Yes. And this is like uh, the story in the jail. These uh, state patrolmen arrested you on false charges and they put you in jail and they beat you almost to death. And uh, you gave me permission to ask, so would you tell the story? Yeah, yeah, that, and that was a similar situation because we was fighting for the same basic right, and this was in 1970, and um, they locked some kids up in jail, and uh, 19 of them, and three of us went to make bond for them, and then that's when they, not only the kids, but us, they tortured us in that jail. Uh, look, it's evil 
to put somebody to death after they've been tortured. Because when you're tortured, this is the nature of torture. Let me explain that. This is the nature of it. You're going to do three things in torture when you're tortured. First thing, you probably will tell the truth, but you, you'll tell a lie. That's the nature of the way they torture you. Then you'll tell the truth. That's the nature. But you will say exactly what the people want you to say, and they ask you the question like that, that if you say that, they're going to let you go free. That's the nature of torture. They tortured us, but when they was torturing us, for the first time, I saw the sinfulness of racism. I saw the depths of it. I saw those people, those white folks look like maggots in there. They looked like dank demons as they was torturing us. But in the midst of that torture, I saw myself. If I would have had an atomic hand grenade, I'm a military guy. If I would have had an atomic grenade, I would have pulled the plug. I saw the evil and what racism do to poor people. <laughs> it makes us all a victim in life. And that night I said to God, I said, God, if you want to, if you let me out of this chair, I know I was bargaining with God. I know I was bargaining with God. Yeah. I said, if you let me out of this jail tonight, I want to preach a gospel that is stronger than racism and bigotry. I want to preach a gospel that can redeem white folk, black folk, Jews, and Gentiles. And that's what Paul said it could do. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the love of God. For it is the power of God. It is. The word of God proclaimed about Jesus' life, death, resurrection. That is the power of God that transferred us from death to life. We are born again into a new family, into the family of God. And boy, being here tonight, day, and being here this week with you, being welcome to tell that story, it's good news. It's good news. It's good news that we can, we can do it. I, again, I'm saying, I, I, I sure never want to insult anybody. The Bible says that we got to preach the truth in love. I want to do that. But I want you to know, I don't believe you can stop it. I, I, I believe that getting mad won't have nothing to do with this. I, I really believe that God now is seeing us fail. And he's inspiring another generation of young folks. We need to be getting on board. Yes. We yes. need to be getting on board. We need to be getting on board. And I think that's what's happening. I think it's happening right here. Yep. And I think that we feel a sense of joy to get this stupidity behind us and become the people of God. Like we are doing yeah, yeah. this morning. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, so uh, yes. there's, uh, there's not reconciliation between two races. There's one race. One, and there's yeah. one church, right? And this racial reconciliation, that was thought up in hell by the devil. There is no history. There is no, there is no sociology. There is no evolution that agree with that as a fact of two races. The Bible says by, from one Blood created all the ethnicities, nations upon this earth. And there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and man. This second race is a slave race to the devil. But what happened to us, we color coded. We dehumanize it for our own economic selfish reason in slavery. And then we brand it and we call it a nigga. So bad that we now is trying to remove it 
from the history books. You know, boy, we have sinned deeply. And God came. They shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save. You know, I've tried it. I've tried it. Ever. I've, I've tried to get rid of my guilt. I've tried to get rid of my sin. I've tried to get rid of my hatefulness to my children and my wife and my friends. I haven't found but one way to do it, and that's to confess it. Psychologists can help me manage it. Psychiatrists can help me do that. I can cover it over. But the little children got it right. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? And nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes us whiter than snow. There is no other fountain I know. Oh, Lord, isn't this beautiful? God loves us. And when we confess our sin, he brings all of himself there. He says, I'm faithful and just. That's the end of what God can be. That's the end of what God can be. I forgive you your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I, I think we got to hear him when he says, you're my people. Us that are called by my name, he says, would humble ourselves and pray and seek his face. He'll hear us from heaven and he'll forgive our sin. I think our land can be healed. Boy, wouldn't you want to be a part of this healing? Wouldn't you want to be a part of this healing? Wouldn't you want to fulfill even Martin Luther King's dream? I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin. But okay, we can make that. We can do it. And I believe this generation, I believe that this is a generation. We need to free them up. We need to rally you and to go into, to go into these schools, go into these prisons, Bring good news there. Go into these neighbors and tutor young people and become friends. Play ball with them. You can't win a championship without it being multiracial. Write that one down. <laughs> Write that one down. Okay, Write now, down. there's one church. There's one humanity, right? One, one humanity. humanity. And there's to be one church. One Not black church, church and white church. Yeah, that, one and, church. And we got it bad. Us black folk got it bad. We ought to see how messy white folk did it. I'm telling us black folks. We need to get rid of our stupidity. And we need to join them together and the people will know we are Christians. Because in Christ, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, born nor free, but we are one in Jesus Christ. He's our peacemaker who has made both one and has broken down. Do y'all like the Bible? I do. <laughs> and I like Jesus. I like that. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All. Oh. All, all other ground. I've tried this other stuff. I've tried this other stuff. It didn't work. Anyway, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left us all messed up, but he cleanses us. He forgives us. Why? This is good news. Good news and uh, joy, right? Good I mean, you're joy. choosing joy. joy. You're, you're saying uh, what's going to lead us forward. This generation sitting right here, what's going to lead joy. us forward joy. is love and joy. And you and I got to be an example of that joy. We do. We, we, we're around fighting each other, trying to pick, find something wrong with each other, nitpicking. Well, we got to find joy. And then I think our joy will come from seeing the fulfillment of our longing in this generation. We, we'll have a sense that a life, there was a lady this week, an old lady, one of your leading black ladies yeah. in the town. She was there. She was so 
absolutely joyful to see what we was doing here in her lifetime. And she, sometimes she had doubt. She had doubt, she said it, yeah. whether she was living her life for nothing. But to spend this week with us, to get, and for me, yeah. and for me, I leave here with greater hope. I live here with greater hope. This is what a church like this can do. We can, we can support some of the churches down there that's doing it. We can start some more down there. And, and we can help some in Haiti. And we can help them in Muslim Beach, one of the poorest places in the world. We can do it. We can do it. We can do it together. We can't do it apart. Y'all can't make your city better without us doing it together. We'll find that out. And we do it because we're the outliving of the in-living Jesus. Because Jesus is living. He, Jesus is continuing his life on earth in us. Amen. We are his ambassadors. God is in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And our joy should be that he forgave us of our sin and asked us to join with him in his redemptive work. Isn't this right? God is in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He, we are his ambassadors to tell people the good news. Nobody said at the end of that text. He actually says if we don't become reconcilers, we are fools. We have received the grace of God in vain. The grace of God come for us to do this. He came for us to let the world know that we are Christian. We can win this game. We can win this football game. You can't win it, white folks, by yourself. Us black folks can't win it by ourselves. It don't work. You ain't going to play in no bowl. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it beautiful? Jesus. Jesus, on Christ the solid rock we stand. You see, he's bigger than our sin. He is, you know what his name is? His name is El Sadat. El Sadat. My kids, I'm an Ebonic speaker. My children try to teach me how to do this stuff. <laughs> I've had some of that in my life, too. Wait, this, this is the big God. <laughs> yeah, bigger than our problems. Bigger than our problems. Bigger than our sin. Yeah. In fact, grace is made stronger in our weakness. Grace is bigger. That's why I say, for by grace are you saved. Through faith. That grace is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. So he's bigger than our problems and he's bigger than our sin. And John, you and I have both buried sons. And Jesus is bigger than death. That's right. He is bigger than death. He's bigger than death. And we don't mind. I don't think many people mind being dead. I think what people... Fear is dying. He done took the stain away. Oh, death, where are you stain? When grace and mercy catch up with you in Psalm 23, when grace and it's following us, it's following us all the days of our life. And when it catch up with us, it carries us into the presence of the Lord forever. Forever. Oh, death, where you're staying. Oh, grave, where your victory. Give your life to Jesus Christ. Give your life to Jesus Christ, and you have found something to live for. And you have found the end of death. You have found eternal life. Death is on a pathway, it's on a little tongue. <laughs> Yes. We're going to pray. You and me, we're going to pray right now. Love it. Okay, you pray first. Father, I thank you for my brother 
who you have blessed 30 so years out here. You bless him. Now, Lord, we are standing together, working together, trying to get this good news yes. to other suffering people. Yes. To the kids in this city, to the kids instead of these jails, uh, let's open up some of these churches, put some computers and some tutors in there with these people. Oh, God, help us to do it together. Black and white. Yeah, help us to overcome. We are overcoming. Yeah. Black and white together. Jew and Gentile together. Yeah. We are doing it in the church. We are doing it in the church. So bless this congregation. Bless us all. Bless us as we go back to Mississippi to continue this work. We ask this in Jesus' name. Dear God, be with uh, Dr. John Perkins and his daughter who's with him, Priscilla, and his family. Vera May, Father, be with them. Bless them. Keep them. Protect them. Give John more years. More years to preach and to uh, carry the good news. Give him great joy. Uh, Father, help us learn from what he brought us. Help us learn from the spirit that brought him here. Father, help us take whatever next steps it is you and this church belongs to Jesus. It's always been Jesus' church. It will always be Jesus' church. What does he want for us? Father, help us see it and have the courage to do it. In his name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.